Man, it, it's always incredible. Um, you know, I, I really don't talk to the band much during the week other than just a few times, but I, I never really know their playlist but uh, what they're going to sing. But that song, The World Behind Me, The Cross Before Me, that's exactly what the message is about today. Good gosh, where did that picture come from? Is that up there every week? Change that thing, my goodness. Uh, I'm glad I never looked behind me. Uh, the world behind me, the cross before me, y'all don't look at that. Turn around. So, anyway, hey, I, it is exciting to be here this morning, but... Uh, you know, it, it's great that song because it fits, because today, this message actually started this year, um, we were out at Mule Deer Camp, and one day, uh, we, we spent the entire day up on a ridge, still Montague and Jeremy and I, and man, I got a lot of sermon material in the side-by-side, -side. Uh, we're not going to use all of that today, but this message came uh, throughout the day, I, I would walk across the top of that ridge to the other side, kind of overlooking a small canyon, and and I could see the ridge line, that, that property we hunt, there's a big tall ridge that, that borders Interstate 10, and on the top of that ridge there's a cross up there. So some of you that have traveled Interstate 10 going to El Paso, once you get out to Fort Stockton, uh, I mean Van Horn, between Van Horn and Sierra Blanca, that ridge is out there, and you'll see that cross. But anyway, I was sitting there, and, and I was looking in this canyon, and I'd sat down on a rock, and, and man, I was just started going through my phone, looking at some old notes and, and reading my Bible. And I got to thinking about that cross up on that ridge. And I'd heard the stories, you know, when that thing was put on the top of that ridge, they didn't have a side-by-side -side and all that stuff. They carried that thing up there. I don't know if they used a mule or a Jeep or what. But, but anyway, it, it was a lot of work. And this thing is a huge cross. It, it's not some little bitty thing. When you get up next to it, it is a big rascal. But as I'm sitting there thinking about that cross, I got to thinking about the cross. And, and how many times do we really understand and comprehend what the cross means and what it represents? You see, a lot of us, myself included, I, I've got a, a, a chain on that my wife and kids had bought me several years ago. It's got a cross on it. A lot of you have a cross necklace or you have a cross on a buckle or something like that. We've got crosses on the walls. Man, it, out here it seems like when people want to bring something to the church, they bring us a wooden cross to put on the wall. At one time, I think we counted 28 crosses people had delivered or brought to the church to put up on the wall somewhere. Well, we just can't put that many up. Plus, apparently that goes against the decoration stuff sometimes, you know, because we just stick stuff everywhere, Jeremy and I do. But how many times do we really comprehend what the cross means, what it represents. This morning, I want you to think for just a minute, how do we start living? Because we've gone through some crazy times in 2020. How do we start living the way that God wants us to live? Do we fully understand and comprehend what it means that cross represents and what it means? But more importantly, how do we become more like Jesus through that cross? You know, I, I, one of the things that I love about our church family out here is we have a lot of people that have an incredible work ethic. I mean, they, they are hard workers. And I'm going to pick on Jeremy just a little bit because I was reading this story this week, Genesis chapter 1, and, and we've all read the story of creation, right? Jesus, I mean, God created the, the heavens and the earth in six days, the seventh day he rested. Do you know on the sixth day he created Adam, he created man? You realize what Adam's first day on the job was? A day off. And I, I was thinking to Jeremy, and I'm thinking, man, if that had been Jeremy Levi, and God created him, and he said, now I want you to tend to this garden and subdue the animals and tend to the animals, he's already got his planter out, and he's got the first day of work lined out in his book, I mean, everything starting at daylight, he's going to tell you, well, okay, I'm going to be taking care of the giraffes and the monkeys and the cows and the sheep, and i got to plow the garden and trim the trees. He's got all this stuff, and then God walks up to him, and he looks at his list, and he says, yeah, that's a good list, but not tomorrow. You're taking a day off. I, I know him well enough, that would blow him up. <laughs> I, I mean, he would just like, what? <laughs> you hired me. Now what I do? Man, it, it, but you know, when I read that story, I'm thinking, man, there is a message in that for us in order to draw closer to the Father. The very first thing he told us to do was that verse we read out of there is be still 
Can you imagine Adam's first day on the job? He was just in the presence of God. There wasn't nothing to tend to. He just sat there. It was a day of rest. If we go to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, you know, that this story here is Jesus has been teaching a large crowd, large crowd. It's late in the day and they're hungry. And Jesus asked his disciples to feed them. We're going to read just a little piece out of Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, starting in verse 34, it says, Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? And they replied, seven loaves and a few small fish. Verse 35, so Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. As I'm thinking about this message this week and over the last several weeks as I've been looking at my notes on my phone that I made up on that ridge and I was thinking, man, how do we ever come to a point where we truly comprehend what the cross represents and how we become more Christ-like? And it just goes, it doesn't comprehend in my brain that the way we do that is just be still and sit. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. I'm going to ask you to put all the junk that's going on in our world out of your minds for a minute. I'm going to ask you to forget about that it's sleeting and raining and all that stuff and it's cold out there for a minute. And just imagine for a second that you are at the foot of the cross. Not a cross, but the cross. You're at the foot of the cross that Jesus was crucified on. Do we truly take that serious? What thoughts would go through your mind as you're kneeled down in front of that cross? What's the first thing that, that comes to mind? I can tell you a few things that I was thinking and what I jotted in my notes over the last few weeks is I believe as I come to that point and I sit at the cross, the first thing that comes to my mind is the seriousness of sin. We live in a country, we live in a world that is compromising biblical values because we don't understand the seriousness of sin. Sin is a big deal. It is a serious deal. And it is something as we kneel at that cross we should never forget or take lightly. In Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, we get the first picture of the seriousness of sin. Genesis chapter 3, as, you, as you've read that, some of you have. If you hadn't, this is where Satan tempts Eve and, and they eat of the tree and then Adam eats of the tree. But when we get to, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 13, the Lord is speaking. And the Lord said, asked the woman, he said, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord said to the serpent, we see the first picture of the seriousness of sin right here. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. I will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Keep reading. Then he said to the woman... I will sharpen the pain in your pregnancy. In the pain you will give birth and you will desire to control your husband and he will not rule and he will rule over you. And to the man he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All of your life you will struggle to scratch out a living from it. I will grow thorns and thistles for you though you will eat of its grain. By the sweat of your brow you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and dust you will return. The very first picture we get of the seriousness of sin is in the Garden of Eden. God didn't make, just slap Adam and Eve on the hand and say, Oh, well, yeah, oh, Satan deceived y'all. Shouldn't listen to him. Now go ye therefore and, and behave. He said, by these things there are consequences for what we do and what we have done, and what we will do. Then we get into the New Testament in Romans 6, 23. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. As I sit at the foot of the cross, the first picture I get is the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of what we do that is in disobe disobedience to the Father, and what we don't do that we know we should be doing. Do you realize as you sit at that cross, 
that it is my sin and your sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. Do you understand the seriousness of what that sin represents? It represents a loving God giving his son for my sin. So now I get to the point and I'm reading this and thinking, man, I don't want this to just be doom and gloom. I mean, yeah, we all mess up. We all sin. The Bible says, for we all fall short of the glory of God. But, but I go back to that first message at Pentecost whenever the apostles are preaching about Christ crucified. And, and I, I love when the Gentiles, somebody stands up and says, brothers, what must we do? You see, that's where I think we are in a country today. We're at that point where we recognize the seriousness of sin. We recognize all the junk going on in our world. But then we keep asking, what must we do? What should we do right now? I believe it's simply this. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal in your life anything that offends the Father. And then we go back to Jesus' first message where he simply preached this. Repent, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Sin is a serious deal. As I'm sitting at that cross, the second thing that came to mind this week was understanding not only that sin is serious, but do you comprehend the depth of God's love when you're sitting at the foot of the cross? I, I don't know about you, that song I can only imagine that Mercy Me sings... I, I can only imagine how much love God had for each and every one of us as I'm sitting at the foot of the cross. Because I'm going to be honest, when I look in the mirror and I see me and I see the stupid stuff I've done, the sin in my life, and I think back that God loved me so much that he sent Jesus to die on that cross in spite of my sins, but more importantly, because of my sins. Guys, we can't truly comprehend that kind of love. I, I can tell you, I love my wife with all of my being. I love my children that way. Them granddaughters that were here a couple of weeks ago, I can't imagine loving anybody any more than I do my family. But God loves us way beyond what we can ever comprehend. God loves us way beyond what we can ever even imagine. The depth of His love is incredible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You see, it's hard for us to truly understand and comprehend the seriousness of our sin. It's hard for us to comprehend the depth of God's love. But Jeremy preached an incredible message last week about the difference between finding contentment and just being comfortable. You see, my prayer this week is you go to the cross. As you put yourself at that spot where you were before God's cross. Guys, that is uncomfortable. That is an uncomfortable place to be because it makes us look at who we are. And what we really do and what we really think and the things that we really do. But we have to understand the depth of God's love. There's another point to this, though, that drives me absolutely crazy. And people say this a lot of times in our world these days. They say, well, how could a loving God let bad things happen? This was asked a few weeks ago. How could a loving God allow COVID to even come into the world? How could a loving God allow people to die? We've already looked at the seriousness of sin. We've looked at the depth of God's love, but I want you to understand this morning the wrath of God, the impact of His wrath. God hates sin so much that in His wrath, in His despising sin, that He allowed His only Son, Jesus, to pay the price. Guys, we can't comprehend that, can we? In His wrath, He allowed Jesus to take on the sin of the world. And see, people think, oh, well, well, it should have ended right there. But guys, Romans 2, chapter, chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, teach us that God's wrath is still there today. Romans chapter 2, verse 7, it says, He will give eternal life to those who keep doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But He will pour out His anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, 
who refuse to obey the truth and instead live lives of wickedness. Verse 9, there will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, evil, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. As I read that verse, man, I've pondered that verse all week long. I've, I've thought about that verse and because I, here's what I don't want you to misunderstand. That because bad stuff happens in the world, it's not because we are in disobedience. It's because the ruler of this world wants to deceive you. And he wants to cause trouble and calamity. Now, is that to say that a born-again believer that is being obedient to God's word is not going to experience trouble in this world? Absolutely, it's not saying that. Because Jesus also says, in this world, you will have trials and tribulations. You will have trouble. There will be hard times. There will be days when people just drive you over the edge to where you have an RCF. For the new folks here, a raging cuss fit. There will be days when things don't go right in your mind. But the question boils down to God still is on his throne. God is still on his throne. And through him, even when we recognize the seriousness of our sin, even when we recognize the depth of his love, even when we understand his wrath, and how much he hates sin and hates disobedience, he still wants a relationship with you right where you are. No matter what you've been doing it, what you've been doing it with, whatever, God loves you. Again, John 3, 16, he loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. And not only did he just send him to die for you, he didn't do that just so he could say, oh, well, well Ken is mine. He accepted me as Lord and Savior. He's mine, and then that's where the story ends. No, that's the beginning of the story. That's where we start writing our story. But we can't ever forget the seriousness, the depth of God's love, and the impact. So my question is, and the point we come to in 2021, where we're starting this year, where is our hope? What, what do we really hope in? What brings that solidness? Galatians 2, verse 20. I love where Paul writes these words. He says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body. If you've tuned out, pay attention right here. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, we make things complicated sometimes. But I'm going to be honest with you, trusting God is complicated sometimes. Heck, we struggle with sometimes trusting a horse that we own or a four-wheeler that may or may not have brakes. Sometimes we trust being with other people. I remember that tractor I had that I knew didn't have brakes. Would Kim get on it? Heck no. She didn't trust the tractor and she didn't trust me. You know? We struggle with trusting God. So as, as I think about this message, I think about this time where we are at the cross. We are on our knees. We are sitting on our hind ends at the foot of the cross and trying to understand what it means and how we can become more Christ-like. It boils down to one simple word, trust. I love in Galatians because Paul starts out in Galatians 2.20 with that. When we get to Galatians 5, we're still at that point. I believe that Paul's sitting, but this, I love Galatians 5.22. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your lives. As Jeremy was preaching that message and I was watching it again for the third time this week, I kept coming back to this verse because true contentment is right here. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our loves, lives. Love, joy, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and I don't like the last one, self-control. Self-control. Paul tells us that if we come to a point where we recognize the seriousness of our sin, the depth of God's love, we understand his wrath, and we understand that it was our sin that put him on the cross, we can find true peace through his Holy Spirit. We can understand what love means, what kindness means, what gentleness, all of these different fruits of the Spirit. But then we get to verse 24, and he's still going through this. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus 
had nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified him there. This past year and the year before last at our dirt retreat, one of the things we did is we we'd built a cross. And the men that were there, they, they would write down on a piece of paper something they were struggling with, whether that was, you know, loving their wives or their kids or pornography or alcohol or drugs. I mean, there was a gamut of old things, but nobody knew what was written on those sheets. And then each of those guys would take that sheet of paper and nail it to the cross with a horseshoe nail. And then at the end of that conference, we set that cross on fire and burned up the piece of paper that was on it. But one thing remained, the cross. It was a little charred. It was a little dirty. But it's still intact. There has been an attack on the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, it didn't come from the enemy, Satan. It came from those of us that claim to be born-again believers. Why have we attacked the cross? Because we don't take it serious. Because we don't understand the depth of what that cross really represents and what it means. You see, that cross is charred because we keep nailing sin to it and we keep asking God to burn it up over and over. But His wrath is the same today as it was back in Genesis. He hates sin. He won't tolerate sin. He loves us in spite of it. But there's a penalty. But praise the Lord that He sent Jesus to pay that price. So let me ask you this simple question. Have you ever had an encounter with the cross? Have you ever had an encounter with Jesus? Somebody's looking at me and thinking, well, man, I don't understand what you're talking about. I'm talking about, have you come to a point in your life where you recognize the seriousness of your sin? Have you recognized how much God loves you? Can you recognize His wrath? But most importantly, can you recognize His grace? See, I've grown up here in that grace, you can make an acronym out of grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. But do we truly understand His grace? And have we come to a point as a country, as believers, where we ask Him to have mercy? Today, I'm going to ask our lay pastors and elders to come on up front, if you would. Guys, I, I want you to know that you are not alone. And if you've come to that point where you have been at the foot of the cross, Jackie, and if, if you and um, Cody would come on up too for ladies that want a lady to talk to. If you've come to that point in your life where maybe you're at that cross today and, and maybe you do have a little bit of a mental picture of what it means, maybe you understand a little bit of what it represents, but you don't know what to do with it. Guys, I, I'm not going to tell you that, that it's just real simple, but it is simple. Because it goes back to trust, but it goes back to this, saying, God, I have messed up. And I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, to die for my sins. And God, from this day forward, I want to follow you. I want to repent. I want to turn back to you. Because, folks, I honestly believe the kingdom of heaven is near. No prophet, no predictionist. I'm not going to say it's going to happen this evening or tomorrow or next week. It may be another hundred years. But I can assure you this. We're one day closer today to Jesus' return than we were yesterday. We'll be one day closer tomorrow than we are today. Are you prepared? Are you willing to go to the foot of the cross and look at yourself? Father, I thank you for your word this morning. God, I thank you for a message that was spoken on top of a mountain. And God, I pray that, that you start with me. God, that I would never forget the seriousness of my sin. God, that I would truly comprehend the depth of your love. And God, I pray that you would give me understanding of your wrath. Father, I thank you for saving a messed up sinner like me. 
And Father, it's my prayer that each and every one of us in this room today, God, that we know that we know where we're going to spend eternity. But Lord, for those that are struggling, those that are torn, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just indwell them today. God, that you would just fill them with the understanding of your fruit. That it is not a spirit of chaos and fear. But God, you bring us love and joy and peace and kindness and gentleness and self-control. So Father, I pray today that the Holy Spirit's leading. God, that you would direct each of us to that cross. But God, as we, we sit there and wait and listen and are fed by you, just like Jesus fed those on the hillside, God, I pray today as we've been fed through your word, God, that we would move forward. God, that people would look at Bandera County, Kerr County, Medina County, all of these surrounding counties and say, there's a beacon of light, and it's Jesus. And it's those that are being bold enough to obey him. Father, we love you. Lord, I'm still blown away at your amazing grace. But God, I ask for your mercy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, as the Spirit leads you, you come up and talk to one of these guys. Stand up, tell somebody you're glad to see them. Guys, y'all drive safe out there. It's pretty nasty. Be careful. Don't get in any hurry. We'll see you Wednesday night, 6.30 for a meal, and then Bible study right after that. We are going through the parables of Jesus on Wednesday night. So God bless y'all. Have a great week.